Probably most of us saw on the news this past week a shocking story that is sad on many levels. But as one eyewitness looked and said at Daytona Beach, Florida, that minivan is getting awful close to the ocean. And then it took a sharp left turn and accelerated into the ocean. But an eyewitness that was even closer in a pickup when they drove by, he thought he heard something, but then he kind of doubted himself. He thought he heard a child say, help me. But then when the van accelerated into the ocean, he jumped out of his vehicle and took off running. And when he opened the back hatch of the van, there were children reaching back for him. And one of them said, mommy is trying to kill us. Ebony Wilkerson was 32 years of age and she was having some kind of mental breakdown. She was pregnant at the time that she did this and she also had a three-year-old, a six-year-old and a nine-year-old in the car. When the six and the nine-year-old were being rescued by a couple of men that were there, a lifeguard was carrying the two children off and she was standing outside the van in a daze. And it wasn't her that told them there was another child in the vehicle. It was the children that called back and said, get our baby, get our baby. And they went back into the vehicle and pulled out the three-year-old. Now, many layers of that story, concerns would arise. Imagine for just a moment, just the fact of having probably a $35,000 van in the ocean. If that was yours and someone sent a picture of it, you'd probably say, what? My, my vehicle's in the ocean, that would raise concern that you would have. But then when you learn, no, there was a person in that vehicle, how do you compare that concern? There's no comparison. A vehicle worth a few thousand dollars or a person's life? Oh, but then when you understand it's not a person, it is persons and it's an adult intentionally doing this with children in the car. Now the layers are getting thicker. And then you find out it's not a kidnapper. It's not a nanny. It's a mother. The gift that God gives children to raise up, to protect, to love, to nurture. And any time we hear stories of children being hurt or neglected by parents, it always breaks our hearts because it goes so far against what God designed. You see, there are a lot of people on this earth that have offspring that never take on the role of parenting by the way God designed it. Today, we're looking at this topic of parenting and the plea for all of us is to look and say, will I be the mother? Will I be the father that God has designed for me to be? We look this morning at Colossians and we notice that the first two chapters give a theology or a study of God. And then in chapters three and four, we see how it's applied. In other words, He's going to talk in the third chapter to fathers, but first he's going to cover in chapters one and two, do you know God? Do you have an understanding of God? He does the same thing in Ephesians. He spends three chapters saying, let's study these things from a perspective of God. Parents, do you know God? Then when you personally know and live for God, he says, now I can talk to you about the role that you are to fulfill in parenting. And listen, this is true in any aspect of our Christian life. If we ever take our emphasis off the theology, if we ever take the emphasis off who is God and what is God's will, we're never going to arrive at the proper understanding of what our life's response ought to be. And so we spent their time this morning looking deeper in Deuteronomy. And we'll just mention that by review real quick, but here's what we asked this morning or discussed. Parents equipped to raise godly children. How, how does that happen? Well, we talked a lot about the parents. 
not so much about the equipping, if you will. Well, we did. We spent the last part of the lesson looking at the equipping. But we talked about the fact that from birth to 18 years old, there's 58,200 waking hours. And if you take the time that the children are in worship and Bible classes uh, during the week, that would come out to 3,744 hours. So, and we're talking about waking hours here. And so then that leaves for the parents 54,456 hours. So what we're studying today is we're studying the idea of what do you as a parent, what do you do with those 54,000 hours with the life of your child that they're awake from the ages of birth to 18? And more importantly, we're studying what would God's will be for us to do with our children during those times. And so we looked over at Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and we saw just like he lays out Ephesians or Colossians, Moses did a similar thing here when he, in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, verse one through six, he said, let's talk to the parents. And he said, first of all, who are you committed to? And then he made this plea to them. And remember, it was a foundational building up. Are you going to love God with all your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength? If so, if you're going to love God with all your being, then we see the fact that you will, in your life, fear him. And that's that awesome fear that we have. Say, God, I want you to reign in my life. Now, if we really do want God to reign, we're going to say the next layer, Lord, I want to hear your commandments. What is your will for me? And when we hear the commandments, the next response is going to be, I want to observe them. Now, we're going to look in just a few minutes tonight to see this, but I want to go ahead and remind you of this seed that was planted this morning. We make a mistake when the only thing we concentrate is on is the observation. Oh, I want to teach my children to obey God. Well, how much theology have you spent with your children? The study of God with your children. It's hard for them to obey a God that they've never been really introduced to. That they don't hear God being spoken about as if he's alive and active in our lives. Listen, if their perception of God is that he is just an object like a church building that you go and, and you attend and you walk through and you walk out, it's going to be hard for a child to have any kind of real relationship with God if we have reduced everything down to the upper crust. And we've missed that loving relationship with God, that great fear for God that says, I want to hear God, therefore I will obey him. And so then that led us to the second focus. First, as parents, we focus on God. And then we read verse 7, where he calls us as parents teachers. And he says, we are to teach. And then he says, we're to teach with diligence. And then he says, in the classroom... It's when you're at home, it's when you're going on your way, it's when you come back and you lay down at night and it's when you get up in the morning. And we talked this morning about the fact that we have a culture that does not act upon the fact that parents should have any responsibility, truthfully, to teach anything. The idea of the way the culture works today, if your child needs to learn something, you need to find someone you can ship them off to. That is a very, very unhealthy culture us as Christians, we need to realize we as parents are the front line of teaching children. And when we can team up with a school system or we can team up with a coach or we can team up with a fifth grade Bible class teacher or, or a youth minister or with a congregation of people that will help us, not do it for us, help us teach our children, we ought to be very grateful. But it's still our responsibility. You know, Barna Research has really done some amazing things through the years, but one of the things that kind of amazes me the most is the research behind this book that was written several years ago. It's Revolutionary Parenting, and it's by George Barna. And the reason that it kind of amazes me is this book was written after studying 10,000. Now listen, there's a lot of books and research written on just studying 100 people. This book studied 10,000 young adults who faithfully lived their understanding of the Christian life. It wasn't just a, a religion that they went to on Sunday. It was something that they devoted their life to so far as service, so far as their moral behavior, and so far as a living relationship with God is the way that they were describing these, they call, he called them spiritual champions. And so I wanted to figure out how is it that these young people made it through the childhood years 
into adulthood and were so faithful to God. And so when they interviewed these 10,000 people, they began to pick up on something. Almost all of them had similar stories about growing up. And so then that led them to do an entire another study, going and interviewing thousands and thousands of the parents of these people. On this next slide, these are some things that found out not about the young people. These were the characteristics about the parents who raised these spiritual champions. Number one, the common, here are some common factors. The parents genuinely loved God. They prayed daily. They worshiped regularly. They read the Bible habitually. Now notice the motive while they were reading the Bible. For personal development. They participated in the life of a spiritual community. We would call that the church. They apply their resources, their spiritual gift, their natural abilities frequently to influencing the lives of others. But notice that last one. They did a lot of God talk. In other words, whenever they were sitting in their house, they talked a lot about God. Whenever they were driving down the road, they talked a lot about God. Whenever they came in, as Deuteronomy would say, to lay down at night, they talked a lot about God. And whenever they would get up in the mornings, they talked a lot about God. Why did they do that? Because God was alive in the lives of those parents. There was a real relationship in the lives of those parents where they're naturally going to talk about the one who influences their lives the most. Think about it. If we really are kingdom people where everything that you do throughout the day, every decision is king led. How you talk to people, how you react when the traffic's bad, everything is about the king. If that was the case, could you then go through that day without talking about the king? It'd be almost impossible, wouldn't it? Because he's on your mind constantly. There's this real relationship with him. And so what's powerful when you study God's word and then when you study all the research, great parenting always comes back to one thing. Parents who are living the life that they should live. They're wholly devoted to God. It is so much easier to teach something that you have been living out. And so therefore your very life is a model of what you want your children to become. And so your life becomes the show and the tell as we model and teach what it's all about. And so for just a few minutes, drop over to Psalm 78 and notice this very same thing as Israel now. Remember we talked this morning, they were over the edge. They're about to be led over by Joshua after Deuteronomy uh, to take in conquest of the land. And when they get the land, all the things that Moses feared for them and urged them not to do, they ended up doing. In other words, they forgot God. And so now he writes to uh, about that in Psalm 78. And notice in the first three verses that we're going to read, and we don't have these verses on the, the screen, so if you want to turn uh, to page 521, there's some Bible in your pews there, it's Psalm 78. And you know the root of obedience is to hear. It, it's that in Greek and it's that in Latin. And, and so I want you to notice, I think it's about nine times in these first three verses when he's trying to get Israel to come back to God, he's going to either use words about them hearing or about God speaking because the emphasis is you can't obey someone that either you're not hearing or they're not talking. And so what he's saying is God's talking. Now the question is, are you hearing? So he starts with that generation and look, if you will, he, he says, give ear, O my people to my law. See, give ear, O my people to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. Some say that that's prophesying what Jesus would do. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have what heard and known and our fathers what have told us. See the emphasis over and over. Look, you've known this. The question is, will you just come back and live it? You're out here in this world of darkness. Why don't you come and live under the king's reign again? You know what it is. You've been told what it is. Will you listen? Will you obey? And now, if they would do that, then they could become people who would have the right influence on the next generation. If we could walk away with something after today, 
I would like for you to walk away with this, not for personal, for study of God's word. It is impossible for you to be the parent that God would want you to be if you yourself are not willing to wholly devote yourself to God. Now, I know there's someone sitting in this audience that you're, you're saying to yourself, well, I know there's areas and I don't plan on changing those right now, but I still love my kids and I'm still going to be the parent I need to be. And you're being fooled. You cannot rebel against God and still be the parent God wants you to be. And that's what we're seeing over and over in the scriptures here. When he talks to parents, he first talks to them about them, their life, their relationship with God. And then he says, now let's talk to you about what you're going to teach your children. And so that's what he's doing with Israel here. He's calling them back. Are you going to come back? Are you going to be what you need to be? Then once he addresses that, look what he says in verse four, and then we're especially going to notice in verse seven. Uh, but, but notice as he speaks here in verse four about the next generation. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generations to come the praise of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. We're not going to have time to parallel that parallel that to verse seven, but it's a neat parallel right there. Look at verse five. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our father. See, we're back to commanding again, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. Now pause there. Did you catch that last phrase? He's saying, I not only want you to live it right, I want you to teach your children that they are going to rise up and teach their children this. When's the last time you've spoken to your fifth grader about how they're going to raise their children? That's what it's talking about here. When's the last time you've talked with your ninth grader about how they're going to raise their children? Look, if we get high school kids that are really committed to raising godly children, what kind of guys and girls are they going to date? If a 10th grade girl is devoted to raising godly children, she's not going to date a loser guy. Because a 10th grader is smart enough to figure out that if I marry this guy and he's the father of my children, he's not going to help my children get to heaven. Why? Because he's not devoted his life to God. But if we wait and we teach that to our children when they're 23 and 24 years old and they're already married to a loser, it's too late to then say, what about your children? Isn't it awesome how God covers all the bases? God right here says, Israel, I'm calling you back. And when you get back to me, I want you to start teaching your children how they are going to teach their children to serve God. If we will devote our life to God and to the next generation, this congregation would be amazing in the years to come for the glory of God. But it's so easy to get distracted and start thinking that all these other things are so important. There's not any sports team, there's not any GPA, there's not any scholarship, there's not any award at school. There is not anything that holds a candle to what we're talking about tonight. You talk about not a close second. There is not a close second. You name what you're devoting your child to and you're rushing them here and you're doing all that and you think that they are set up for success if they do not know that their task is to raise godly children, you've missed it. The kingdom is more important than you individually. The kingdom is more important than your child individually. The kingdom is about reaching us and then reaching the next generation, reaching us, reaching the next generation. And it goes that way until the Lord comes again. So how's that going to be done? Verse seven, he spells it out in a beautiful way. We saw this morning, we as parents are to be the teacher. We're to do it with diligence and we do it every, everywhere at home when we're going about. And you say, okay, so what are we to accomplish? Here is what would be success according to God. This is what we're supposed to teach our children. Verse seven that they may set their hope in God. 
and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Now, notice those three phrases again. Number one, he says, I want you to teach your children to set their hope in God. Number two, I want you to teach them not to forget the works of God. And then number three, to keep the commandments of God. Do you notice that order there? When you start with number three, you're off base. You start with number one, and that is set your hope in God. We're not going to go back right now, but you remember a few weeks ago, we studied Colossians, the first chapter. How do you set your hope on God? One is you seek those things which are above. You say, you know what? I'm not living for this earth. There is nothing on this earth that can take care of me. When our children think, if I make a certain GPA, I have done everything I need to do in school. If I can start for a certain team, I've done everything that I can need to do. If I can get out of college and make six digits, I have done everything that I need to do. If I can live on this side of town, or if I can live in this house, or if I can have 10,000 or 100,000 or a million Facebook friends, I have done everything that I need to do. No, until we can say, you know what? None of that stuff will give me hope. There's not a salary that will give you hope. There's not a level of popularity that will give you hope. The only thing that will give us hope is God. We seek God. We set our affections on things above. We take the old person and we crucify that old person. And as he says in Colossians 3 and 3, he says, we are dead and now we are living to Christ. And that's why he can say in verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears. That's hope. But notice the second thing we do. Once we realize that all of our life is about living for God, then we see the need to be reminded of how powerful God is. If you have your Bible open, glance down, and this is how he did it with them. And of course, this would not be the only way to do it because we have an entire Bible to work from here, and then we have our own lives to work from. But what he did with them to remind them of the works of God He talked with the children of Israel about the children of Israel in the past and about the wonderful works that God had done for them. You see there in verse 12, he says it's marvelous things that God has done in their sight. And then he names a few examples and we'll only mention a few. Look in 13, when the enemy was coming to kill them, it was God who did this marvelous work of dividing the sea and saving their life. And then when they went over into the wilderness, notice in 14, when they didn't know where to go, It was God who did this marvelous work. He sent a cloud to guide them in the daytime and a fire to guide them by night. And and then when they were over there and they didn't have water to sustain their life, it was God who took a rock and he could split the rock open. And not only could he give them water, and that verse he says, uh, flowed a river of water. Do you see what is being done here toward Israel? Someone says, why should I put my hope in God? He says, let me tell you how great this God is. When your back's against a wall and no one can save you, God can. Let me tell you what he did for Israel. Let me tell you what he did for me. And then when you feel like you don't know where to go or what to do, Let me tell you about a God who can guide you. Let me tell you about a God who's gracious, he's loving, and his truth is true every time. I can tell you about how he guided Israel. I can tell you how he guided the apostles. I can tell you how he guides us. And you can't make it. You can't make it without him. Let me tell you how he sustained Israel. Let me tell you how he can sustain you. You see, first he began with hope. But then he moved to the marvelous works of God so that they could know that that hope could be trusted. And it was only then that we come to the third thing that he says, now keep his commandments. Why wouldn't you keep his commandments? I mean, think about it. If... If someone truly convinced you of the first two, no one could convince you not to do number three. How powerful is that? Remember when John 6, the end of the chapter, huge multitude of people walking away from Jesus. They're leaving him. 
Jesus loved those people. Those were souls. Can you imagine how that broke Jesus' heart? He didn't chase after them and say, let me water it down. Let me make it easier. They're going to walk away, so he's letting them walk away. But can you imagine the look in his eye when he turns around to the apostles and he says, are you going to go with them? Remember Peter's answer? Lord, to whom would we go? You are the one with the words of eternal life. You see what Peter was saying? Somebody had taught Peter, Lord, you are our only hope. He had seen the marvelous works. He put his hope and Peter obeyed. When we go to this next slide, we see uh, an example here of, do you see in the pyramid there, you have a visible and an invisible line. And of course, actions in the lives of people are visible. And so if we're not careful as parents, what we do is we talk all the time about the things that are visible. We talk to our kids about things that you can hear them say or they shouldn't be saying. Or actions that they should do or they shouldn't do. And when they do or don't do it, you can see that they did or didn't do it. And so if we're not careful, we just start building a relationship with our kids. And maybe in our mind, we're building it around God, but all we ever talk about are the actions. And listen, if that's all we ever talk about, we're not building it around God. Satan has tricked us. We have to go below the surface and we have to get down into belief. Does your child believe that God is the only hope? And I don't say this as if it's easy. I don't say this as if you ought to have this together so easy. But we've got to say this. If your child doesn't believe God is the only hope, you have to get busy. This is too important. And it's your job. It's not anybody else's job on earth. It's your job to make sure that your child hears so much about the awesome power of God that they realize, well, where are we going to turn? Well, mom and dad said, if I just get a big scholarship, but my life's taken care of. It's not taken care of. Well, mom and dad said, if I get a great degree, that my life's going to be easy. Really? You really think you're going to get a degree and life's going to be easy? Why do we say that garbage to our kids? Without the hope of God, they are lost. They have nothing of value. Nothing. If a man gains a whole world and loses his own soul, what does he profit? Well, he, he got a six-digit salary. That's what he, really? So if we convince our children to have a belief system that the only hope is in God. Those beliefs are going to form values. I like to call those values also slash conviction. When a child really believes their only hope is in God, they start listening to what God says and they form convictions. And somebody comes up to them at school and tries to get them to do something wrong and they have a conviction they have a conviction before their mouth ever opens, before their foot or hand ever moves. They have a conviction inside that says, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I know what God says and my only hope is in God. I'm not going to leave God right now to go over here with this kid to do something that is against God. And so what do we see? Now it becomes visible. We hear the child say, no, that's all right. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. And it's a beautiful thing. But listen, the beautiful thing is not just the action. The beautiful thing is the conviction that's tied to a belief that says, I know who my God is and I know that I'm nothing without him. I know the marvelous works that he's been doing for thousands of years and I know the marvelous works that he's going to do for an eternity. I'm not leaving God. Who could teach a child to do that? Only parents who are already doing it. Now, does that mean a child doesn't have any hope if they don't have a parent in that way? No, not at all. But we're going by God's plan for parenting. God's plan for parenting is for that to be the plan. 
And if a child can't get that from their parent, hopefully they can get it from a grandparent. They can get it from an uncle or an aunt. Hopefully they can get it from a brother and sister in Christ. And what they have done then is they have found the faith that God put on the shoulders of the parents to give them. And even though their parent didn't give it to them, they found it in spite of their parent. That's what that means. Let's skip next to the last slide. I want to close by reminding you of the verse that Paul said to the people of Philippi. And I like to think of this as if he's speaking that spiritual father. And this is how we close this morning. And then I want to show you just a quick diagram. These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Can your child say, all of these things we've studied about tonight, I've learned them from my mama and from my daddy. I've received them from my parents. I've heard them from my parents because in their life, they have showed me these things in their life. And if, if our children can say that, they probably at this age don't even realize how blessed they are. If they can't say that that's true, you still can overcome. But make sure that you raise your children up in that way. And so we say, what's the influence of teachers? And we think about parents being the teacher. Well, if your sphere of influence is very small, it's just pretty much content. What'd you say? That's really not a powerful teacher. But what if you can draw that circle bigger and say your sphere of influence is larger when, when it's content and communication both? How did you say it? Did you say it in love? Did you say it in a convincing way? Were you zealous about the way you said it? But then you want to really magnify, and that, that chart, in my opinion, doesn't do it justice. If you want to draw that next circle, it'd have to go way off the screen. And so you want to really have a powerful impact it's not just what you say and how you say it, but then it's this, are you living it? And when you're living it and you're saying it and you're living and saying it in love, God would say, parents, that's the way it should be. Can I just remind you for just a moment, I'm kind of sounding like the old guy here. You say, wow, I'm so thankful we had a birthday last month. And my child is three. We don't have to have those terrible twos again. It's like a fist pump and you give each other a high five and you're like, whoo, terrible twos are over. And you know what? You're exactly right. You won't ever, ever have those terrible twos again. They're gone. And there'll come a day where you'll be able to look back and say, you know what? It'd be neat to kind of have those terrible twos back just for a day or two, wouldn't it? But you won't. And you'll walk them into kindergarten one day. But you'll only walk them into kindergarten the first day once. And that day's over and it's gone. You'll send them off to junior high, but you only do it once. You'll send them off to high school once. And those hours that we talked about at the beginning that seem so large, they go by like that. And you don't get one of them back. If you believe that we really talked about some of the most important things about parenting, I urge you to realize you must work on this today. This isn't something that you say somewhere down the road when my work slows down, when I get things in, in an easier situation. You can't do it that way. Because they only pass through your house for that opportunity for you to raise them right. 
ones. I hope that we love our kids enough and that we love their soul enough that we're committed tonight to do whatever we have to do to make sure that our children are being raised by a godly parent. And that's up to you. We'll sing a song of encouragement. What a powerful example would be for your child to see you make your life right with God. If it's not right. What a powerful example would be for you to sit down tonight and have a talk with your child. And if you haven't been the parent that you should be, to apologize to them and ask their forgiveness. And let them know that that'll change in a very good way. Whatever. I just beg you to not be apathetic. If you're ready to become a Christian or you're ready to be restored, we can help you in any way. Come as we stand as we sing.